It is the 30th of June of the year 1559, and the place is a richly adorned tournament field in France. Two decorated knights sit astride their war horses, opposite one another, waiting for the signal to charge their mounts forward, lower their lances, and crash into one another. This was the joust, a centuries-old tradition of the tournament ground where two warriors tested their mettle against one another in a mock conflict that was meant to substitute real battle. It was a dangerous sport for the brave and the bold, one that required strength, skill, and courage. Two armored knights charging towards one another at full speed was a dangerous game. Men could be hurt, crippled, or killed. Even in a good-natured joust between friends, accidents could happen. As he gripped the reins firmly in one hand and steadied himself in the saddle of his horse, one of the combatants closed the steel visor of his helm and he looked out of the thin window this gave him at the tourney field just before him. Holding his arm out, the knight signaled for his squire to bring him his lance. Couching the massive length of wood under his arm, the knight was finally ready to give his mount the spurs. The man had done this before. He was skilled and practiced on the tourney field. You see, the man was no ordinary knight. He was the King of France. Little did he know at the time it would be his final joust. This is the story of the death of King Henry II of France. This is the retelling. Henry II of France was never supposed to be king. Twenty-three years earlier, in 1536, Henry's older brother, the Dauphin, had collapsed and died while playing a game of tennis, thus giving way to Henry to become heir. He was a fine king for the time, neither great nor terribly incompetent. He was fond of hunting, falconry, and the spectacle of tournament. There is little remarkable to say about Henry's policies as king. Europe at this time was a violent and shifting land of religious wars and political strife. Just as there was no shortage of enemies to fight, there was also no shortage of reasons to fight them. The divide between Catholics and Protestants was reaching its zenith around this time. Religious differences were so prevalent, so volatile, that no nation was safe from the strife that swept the continent. Then there was France's old enemies on the world stage, England, Spain, Italy, and the Holy Roman Empire. It was a time of great political tension, violence, and uncertainty, and steering France through this mire was King Henry II. Fervently Catholic, Henry offered no love or support to the Protestants of his realm. In dealing with Protestants, he was quick, effective, and often quite brutal. In some things he was good. Henry was a fine administrator both at home and abroad. He did his best to secure peace treaties and strengthen alliances with whichever nations he wasn't actively fighting against, and in his home life he balanced married life with the habitual infidelity that came along with being a king. Even though he was married to the powerful and influential Catherine de' Medici, Henry never abandoned his mistress and his true love a noble woman called Diane de Poitiers, an elegant, wise, and confident woman of the Renaissance who Henry had known since his childhood. The two had always been fond of one another, and they would remain so until the end of their lives. But balancing wives and mistresses are not the only responsibilities of kings. In 1551, Henry declared war on the Holy Roman Empire in an effort to seize Italian territories. The Holy Roman Empire was a vast and powerful domain ruled over by one of the strongest dynasties of the age, the Habsburgs. In a time of great dynasties, the Medicis, the Borgias, the Tudors, the Habsburgs were perhaps one of the most powerful. At the height of their power, they controlled Spain, Austria, the Netherlands, Italy, parts of France, and more. They would even go on to control lands in the New World. 
All of this is to say the Habsburgs were a formidable and capable enemy for Henry II. Fortunately for the King of France, he would be spared the full might of a unified Habsburg opposition, because in the year 1556, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, abdicated, and the massive Habsburg domain was divided between his sons. Despite this, the war was not a clean-won victory for France, or anyone else for that matter. After eight years of fighting, France had won some territories, including the port of Calais, but in the end, Henry had to relinquish any claims he had on Italy. The Italian War, as the conflict would come to be known, would be one of the first in a new age of warfare, one that depended on professional soldiers, hired mercenaries, and gunpowder. Long gone were the days of simple stone castles built to keep out the rabble. In their place were enhanced, complicated fortifications engineered to withstand artillery. Long gone, too, were the days of peasant armies conscripted on the orders of their local lord. In their stead were professional trained soldiers, well equipped and well paid. These new armies were expensive to raise, and even more expensive to maintain. By April of 1559, all sides were strapped for cash, and were ready to end the fighting. With tens of thousands dead and some lines on maps redrawn, the Italian wars came to a close at the signing of the Treaty of Cateau Cambrésis, where England, France, and Spain met to hash out a peace and conclude hostilities. The years of war had come to an end, and a new age of peace and security was set to begin. To commemorate the peace, weddings were planned and carried out, unions between the recently warring nations that were meant to bind them together and act as a sort of insurance for the future peace. One of these marriages was between Henry II's daughter, Elizabeth, and the Habsburg King of Spain. To celebrate this union, a tournament was held, which brings us back to where this story started, on that warm day in June 1559, when King Henry II shot his helmet on his visor and prepared to gallop his war horse along the jousting lists. Riding against the king that day was the captain of his bodyguards, Gabriel Deloge. Gabriel was no amateur. As captain of the king's bodyguard, he would have known well how to fight on foot or on horseback. He was a fighting man who would go on to be a career soldier with his own interesting story. On the 30th of June, 1559, however, Gabriel Deloge would have experienced one of the most memorable events of his life. Opposite the king in the lists, Gabriel would have prepared for the joust in much the same way, he would have donned his helm, summoned his squires, and readied his lance. Perhaps he played to the crowd, or saluted the king. With both men encased in their armor and their horses eager to gallop, the jousts were set to begin. King Henry II, in his expensive armor and wearing the colors of his longtime mistress, Diane de Poitiers, he would have been the crowd favorite, earning cheers and praise from them as he took his place on the starting mark. Opposite him, Gabriel Deloge did the same. Then they were off. Driving his spurs into his horse's flanks, King Henry hugged the saddle with his legs, and he leaned forward as his mount surged forward. Opposite him, the captain of his bodyguard did the same, and the two men were closing the distance between them with lances lowered. The hooves of their horses thundered against the raked earth of the tourney field, as the distance between them shortened. They were 100 meters apart, then 50, 25, 10, each rider poised with perfect form. Then they clashed. The rules of a tournament joust could vary wildly from event to event. Sometimes they could be a point-based system, while other times the sole objective might be to unhorse the other rider or force him to yield. Prizes for the victor could vary as well, from winning horses, weapons, and cash, to simply earning glory, favor, and fame. The rules of this particular joust have been lost to time, and frankly, they don't matter. 
There were no winners in the contest between King Henry II and Gabriel de Lorge. There were only losers. As King Henry II and Gabriel de Lorge met, their lances smashed into one another, splintering against plate armor with a tremendous crash that knocked the breath from both riders. The men would have reeled in their saddles from the force of the blows as their horses ran the length of the lists. On one end of the tourney field, Gabriel slowly recovered himself, while on the other end, it was clear that something was very seriously wrong with the king. In the moment of impact, a thick splinter of Gabriel's shattered lance had slid into the eye slit of King Henry's helm and had been driven deep into the king's eye and beyond, into his brain. It was a ghastly accident, and one that would have quickly put an end to any joyous celebrations. The king was mortally wounded, but not yet dead. Hurried off the field, King Henry II would have been suffering from excruciating pain, possibly lapsing in and out of consciousness as his servants and attendants hauled him away, leaving a crimson trail in their wake. For someone alive in the 16th century, even a king with the best doctors and surgeons around, the wound was a death sentence. Unfortunately for King Henry II, however, his death would not come quickly. For days he lingered in agonizing pain as the wound in his eye and brain slowly got worse and worse until it ultimately became infected and turned septic. During this time, access to the king was severely limited by his wife, the queen. When Henry begged to see his true love, his longtime mistress, Diane de Poitiers, he was refused. Diane herself had likewise tried to see Henry, but to no avail. Diane and Henry would never see each other again. On the 10th of July, 1559, King Henry II of France died a full ten days after receiving the wound to his eye. King Henry II's death marked a changing point in France and the decline of the House of Valois. His throne passed to his 15-year-old son Francis, a sickly boy who ruled for a little over a year before he too passed away, and the throne went to his ten-year-old brother Charles, who was heavily influenced by his mother, the Queen, who served as his regent. Charles would grow up to become Charles IX, and his reign would be plagued with the explosive religious and civil violence that had been building over the past years. In the coming years, France would continue to fall deeper and deeper into division and unrest as the old ways of feudalism and monarchy began to be tested and questioned. In addition to this, Henry II's death also marked a decline in jousting and tournament games. While they would continue on in some places for years to come, there wasn't a court in all of Europe that didn't heed the lessons of Henry II's untimely death. Jousting was a dangerous sport from a dangerous age, and times were changing. In the decades to come, the nobility would turn their interests to other, safer equestrian activities, like polo and fox hunting. For a number of years, there was some speculation as to why King Henry II took to the field at all that day, as he appeared to have been warned against it. Employed in King Henry II's court was a famed astronomer and fortune teller by the name of Nostradamus. And included in his many predictions, there is one that is written, The young lion will overcome the older one in a field of combat in a single fight, he will pierce his eyes in their golden cage, two wounds in one, then he dies a cruel death. Haunting as this prediction may sound, there is no evidence that it was actually recorded before Henry II's death, meaning it was likely added after the event to lend weight to the other predictions of the famed fortune teller. So that's the story of the death of King Henry II of France. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy, please consider leaving a like or a comment to help the channel grow. I'll see you in the next one.